Is everybody ready? Let me begin by expressing thanks to uh, all of you for coming this afternoon. I've had a couple of uh, very productive and good days here in Israel, and we'll be headed back to uh, the U.S. later tonight. Uh, but it's been a, an enlightening time to uh, once again be reminded of the extraordinary relationship between the United States and Israel, and especially during such a time as uh, our country is making serious decisions regarding the affirmation of the administration's proposal for a deal with the Iranian government. I've been outspoken in my belief that this deal represents a clear and present danger, uh, not just to the people of Israel, but specifically to the people of the United States. Uh, the Iranians have made it very clear for 36 years that their intention is not only to wipe Israel off the face of the map, their words, but also to bring death to America. And they have chanted that repeatedly. And they have threatened it. And unleashing $150 billion of new capital into their hands of unfrozen assets would be the equivalent in U.S. dollars of about $5 trillion worth of resources and assets, given the uh, scale of our economies. I think most of us in the United States believe that $5 trillion would uh, be a sizable sum of money. And it would be uh, an extraordinary amount of money, especially if a government had uh, no honorable intentions of spending it in a way that actually helped people who were poor or who were sick or who were hungry, but rather whose first major action was to purchase new weapon systems uh, and delivery systems from the, Soviet, uh, from the Russian government. This again is just a reminder that uh, this is not a regime whose intentions are to become a partner to peace. This is a regime whose intentions have for 36 years to be a force of terror in the Middle East and throughout the world. They've kidnapped Americans, they've killed Americans, they currently hold Americans hostage in their prisons. I've read the entire 159 page deal and I would like to have been able to say that after reading it, I was more comforted. But quite frankly, after reading it, I was more alarmed. And I realized that uh, this is a deal that I'm hoping that many Americans will continue to find objectionable. And um, it's encouraging to me that about two-thirds of the American public is opposed to the deal. I'm grateful for Senator Menendez, who yesterday announced his opposition, joining with uh, Senator Chuck Schumer of New York, two very prominent Democrats, meaning that this is not just some partisan divide in Washington, as most issues tend to be. This really does get to the heart and soul of the security and peace of the United States, of our ally Israel, but quite frankly, for all of the uh, members of the Gulf states region, uh, all of whom have reason to be genuinely concerned about the Iranians uh, being able to develop ultimately nuclear capacity. Uh, the deal does not really prevent them from having nuclear weaponry at some point. It simply puts a longer fuse on what is still going to be their desire to have weapons of mass destruction and nuclear capacity. Uh, while I've been here, I've had a chance to meet with a number of Israeli officials. Um, obviously, I don't have uh, the liberty to discuss the contents of those uh, conversations because they were, in fact, uh, private and confidential. Uh, but it, it certainly was encouraging to uh, visit with longtime friends here in Israel and to, uh, to be affirmed in that uh, this deal, whether it's seen from American eyes or Israeli eyes, really does present some serious challenges uh, to all of our future. Um, with that, I will open up for some questions. Yes? Uh, Molly Hunter from ABC News. Can you talk a little bit about yesterday's fundraiser um, and why you chose to go to, um, to a settlement, to the Visitor Center settlement, um, an area, of course, that international law considers occupied territory, as opposed to fundraising um, among American Jews and Israelis in Tel Aviv or Jerusalem, um, where, uh, where there are many? Well, first of all, the, uh, the event was hosted uh, by an individual who chose to have it at that location. I was not in the least hesitant to go to Shiloh. 
in part because uh, 3,500 years ago, it was the capital of Israel. It was the seat of the tabernacle. It is a place of great connection in history to the Jewish people. Uh, the fact that it is in Samaria is immaterial to me because uh, I would happily go to Shiloh at any, uh, at any time. And I've been throughout the region of both Judea and Samaria. Um, I think it's very important that uh, as Americans we show our support for the Israelis and their capacity to build uh, their neighborhoods in their own country. And I have been doing that. This is not something new for me. It's been this way for as long as I can remember uh, since my early trips to Israel, the first of which was 42 years ago, back in 1973. Uh, exactly 42 years and one month ago to be exact. So I would dispute. One is West Bank. I, I call these Judea and Samaria. Uh, the second term is uh, occupied. I don't see it as occupied. That, that makes it appear as if someone is illegally uh, taking land. I, I don't see it that way. Uh, and the third thing is the very use of the term illegal. Again, I point back that Israel has more of a connection to lands in Judea and Samaria, specifically Shiloh, where I was last night. 3,500 years of connection to that very piece of property. I mean, it would be very easy for me to say that in America, uh, we have about a 400-year relationship to Manhattan. Um, it would be if I came and said, you know, I think we, we need to end our occupation of Manhattan. I'm pretty sure that most Americans would find that laughable because they'd like, we've got an incredible connection here. I, I think the Israelis have a strong connection to, uh, to land in Judea and Samaria. Well, if we go back all, all the way even to more modern history, um, back to the Balfour uh, Declaration, uh, whether we go to uh, the original 1948 agreement that was rejected by uh, many countries but was accepted by uh, the international community at that time, um, then the boundaries shifted after the 1967 war. Um, I, I guess I'm not sure why the international community would continue uh, to expect Israel not to secure a safe and secure homeland for its people and to provide security. And having been uh, through that territory for many, many years, I cannot imagine that any American who comes here would somehow feel that the Israelis are out of line in wanting to put as safe a barrier between them and their sworn uh, enemies as, as is possible. If you allow me a last question. Sure. When I'm elected president, yes. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> um, would that be a policy that you would um, continue pursuing, knowing that that would make you alone uh, among the world's nations in having this kind of uh, position? I've been alone a lot of my life on a lot of things, and I wouldn't mind being alone if I felt it was the right thing. And I feel it is the right thing to stand with Israel in uh, making sure that they have the right to secure their homeland um, with safe and defendable borders. It's interesting to me that often our government has uh, put more pressure on the Israeli government to stop building bedrooms in their own neighborhoods than they put on Iran to stop building bombs. I don't know if anyone's ever been injured by a neighborhood, but they sure as heck have been injured by Hamas and Hezbollah rockets being fired, whether from Lebanon or from Gaza aimed directly at civilian population. Not unintentionally, but intentionally. All the more reason that we should be supportive of the uh, Israel uh, government for making sure that they protect uh, their property and also making it so that there's uh, adequate room for, for them to grow and uh, have a place for their children and grandchildren and future generations. Yes, sir. If, when you're like <laughs> See, I've got you on the habit now. It was good. <laughs> would you, uh, if this uh, Iranian deal goes through Congress, would you backtrack on it? Would you, would you tear it up? Uh, well, to say backtrack, I, I would simply, uh, from the very beginning of my presidency, make it very clear that this deal is an unacceptable deal uh, for a peaceful future, not just for the United States or Israel, but for really all the world. Uh, this does not accomplish anything other than empowering a rogue nation. 
a nation that has shown consistently, uh, consistently its intention to wipe other nations, including America, right off of the map. And when people continue for 36 years to threaten to annihilate you, at some point I think you should take them seriously. And you should not empower them. You should not provide the bullets and assist them in loading them when the gun is pointed to your own head. That's just not a very smart or strategic move. So the answer is yes, I would most certainly uh, undo it. I would replace with the sanctions. I would focus on developing U.S. energy to replace Iranian energy so that we would begin to uh, be the exporter to Europe, to Africa, to Asia. Uh, take the funding mechanism away from the Iranians, which is their greatest asset, their greatest leverage point is uh, their capacity to supply energy. Take it from them and try to bankrupt them and hope that in the meantime that there is an uprising of the good and decent people of the Iranians uh, who would perhaps bring an end to this regime. As they attempted to do, let me just say, back in 2009 when they were brutally pushed back uh, by this very, very barbarian government. Yes? Um, how to live on the news. Hi. Uh, Israeli officials, uh, you yesterday, you mentioned that you have received support for your uh, um, comments, the controversial comments about uh, uh, Obama pushing uh, Jews or Israel into the oven. Israeli officials, um, officials have said that uh, these comments were inappropriate and that Israel can't, today can defend itself by itself. Sure. Do you agree? Israel most certainly can defend itself. That wasn't the point I was making. My point was not could they defend themselves, but would someone attack them? Would someone attempt to annihilate them? I have to take the Iranians at their word. I mean, those are not my words. Those are the Iranians. The Iranians said, I exact quote, we have developed the missile systems that can deliver the Holocaust to Israel. Exact quote. I didn't make that up. The Iranians did. So there's nothing in any of the comments I've made that I th feel to be inaccurate or inflammatory, I think that they were exactly on target. And that's why I've said uh, I take nothing back. And I've also had the strong support of a number of Jewish organizations, most notably uh, the Zionist Organization of America, the oldest, one of the largest, uh, perhaps one of the most prestigious pro-Zionist organizations in the entire world. Um, also the Friends of Likud another organization that has been very supportive, as well as individuals, not only in America, where the very evening that this news story broke, uh, I was in a fundraising event hosted by a Jewish doctor in New York. There were six or seven Holocaust survivors at that event. They came up and hugged me, thanked me. A number of rabbis were there, thanked me. On the streets of Jerusalem uh, these past two days, uh, I've had people come up to me and thank me for the comments and say they appreciate the, the candor and the clarity of that, where we'd like to be, which is not in the very front, because the Republicans have a long history of whoever is in the front right now is absolutely never in the front when it comes time that it matters. Eight years ago, the person in front was Rudy Giuliani. He was uh, ahead two to one over the next competitor, which was Fred Thompson. In a distant third was Mitt Romney, and in the more distant fourth was uh, John McCain. And way back in the back of the pack was me. John McCain ended up with a nomination. I came in second. Rudy Giuliani and Fred Thompson dropped out before uh, the game really got started uh, very well. Four years ago, Rick Perry was ahead two to one of his nearest competitor, who I believe at the time was uh, Michelle Bachman. Mitt Romney was a third. Everybody else was a distant. And um, I think we all know it was Mitt Romney who got the nomination. It was not Rick Perry who dropped out early, as did Michelle Bachman. So if history has any, any lessons at all, um, I know it may sound cold, but our campaign uh, advisor who's here with me today, Chip Saltzman, has often said, if you're hot when it's hot, you'll be cold when it's cold. And when it's the hot summer and you're hot, you'll probably be cold when it's the cold winter. What do you think Americans like about that? You'd have to ask them. The one thing I'm not going to do is help Donald Trump get any more publicity than he's getting. He's getting ten times to anybody else, and I think he's uh, doing well without my help. Yes, sir. Uh, I've been the view from Bloomberg News. Hi. Um, we're not going to be the evangelical community of which you're part of and which has supported you politically in the past. Israel is certainly one of their 
important issues in the foreign policy maybe mm -hmm. the most important. So what does it, this trip coming here now mean do you think to the evangelical community? And do you think they'll continue to support you, for example, in Iowa where they definitely have they did in the past and have power factor? Well all the smart ones certainly will continue to support me. We'll find out uh, you know how wise they are. Uh, you know, I didn't come here because it was a particular political calculation. Uh, I, I think it might be if this was my first and only trip to Israel, if I was making this as a typical Republican, check the box, go to Israel, say all the things I'm supposed to say in the script. Uh, but I think most people know 42 years of coming here dozens of times, three times last year. This is my second trip this year. Um, I'd be coming to Israel even if I wasn't running for president. In fact, I might be here more. Um, so my commitment to the relationship between Israel and the United States is not as much political as it is visceral and personal. Uh, it is a matter of deep conviction, one that uh, was first formed in my heart 42 years ago as a 17-year-old who came here for the first time. And it's a relationship that has only grown stronger through those uh, many years and, and many trips back here. Well, could you just say one word about like I said, it is an issue for the evangelical community of Israel and the importance of coming here. I think Israel is an important issue, certainly for the evangelical community, but I think it's important for all Americans. Americans uh, overall deeply care about Israel because they know that Israel most mirrors America. People in America understand that our relationship, Israel and that of the U.S., is organic not just organizational, that there is a connection between the way we approach civilization, that we are a people who believe in the worth of the individual, we believe in equality for men and women, we believe in education, um, we believe in freedom of speech, we believe that people have a right to dissent. <coughs> Israel may be one of the few nations on earth that actually uh, can outdo the Americans in terms of uh, the intensity of political discourse. There's no shortage of disagreement. Uh, Israelis sometimes tell me here that uh, where two Israelis are gathered, there's at least four different opinions, all expressed with great enthusiasm. That is a mark of, of a free people. It's the mark of a civilized people who can dissent and yet live together. And for those reasons, it's not just evangelicals who feel this connection. I think that most of America feels an extraordinary sense of uh, camaraderie with the Israeli people. Uh, yes, I'll take yours and then go back to you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Mike Smith from AFD. Um, I wonder if you could tell us at the fundraiser how much did you actually raise? And second of all, um, regarding this issue, uh, you know, wading into such a volatile issue such as West Bank settlements for the purposes of raising money for a campaign, do you view that as irresponsible in some way? Ob absolutely not. Uh, don't know what the amounts were. Um, I don't usually get into the uh, details of collecting the checks personally, and uh, we don't normally release the details of a fundraising event except in the required uh, disclosures that we will have to do each quarter. But I absolutely have no qualms whatsoever about having been to Israel, no qualms about going to Shiloh. As I said before, I think it's, in a, perfect, uh, it's a perfectly appropriate um, action on my part, and Frankly, it's such a rich piece of the history of this country that I, I would find it amazing that somehow uh, I would self-restrict myself from being able to see one of the most notable places of biblical as well as Jewish history. It's an extraordinary place that uh, I would hope that every Israeli would go to and pay homage to and that every American who comes to Israel would also go and see because it's a remarkable place. Yes, sir. There were a number of other meetings. I'd rather those uh, be disclosed by the individual ministers and members of the Knesset because it would not be um, incumbent upon me to, to make any of them feel uncomfortable with having met with me. I want to make it very clear. I've, I've known the Prime Minister for probably 20 years. I've known him prior to his being Prime Minister and in government. I've known him when he was in, when he was out, in between, and we have a long-time friendship. 
Uh, I want to make very clear there was no implicit or explicit endorsement simply because he met with me. Uh, no expectation of that. Uh, he's made it very clear that he has no intention of getting in the middle of American politics. So uh, let it be clear that uh, the Prime Minister in no way, by his meeting, endorsed me. But I don't have any hesitancy in endorsing him as a true leader in the fight against the Iranian deal and deeply appreciate uh, the manner in which he has articulated the concerns, uh, concerns that I too share. Does that answer your question? Or? Yeah, I just was curious about can you share with us who, uh, other than the Prime Minister we need? As we get permission from individual people, we'll release information probably on my Facebook page. Understand that when I have a meeting that I consider to be uh, off the record or a confidential meeting, I never feel it's appropriate to disclose the contents of that because I might want another meeting someday. Yeah. Yes, okay, thank you for, for reminding me. Um, it's, it's really going to be in the Palestinians' hands. Do they want peace? If they do, then I think the beginning place is to openly recognize Israel's right to exist, uh, to excise from their textbooks teaching that is derogatory toward Jews, um, a full-throated denunciation of terrorism when it happens against uh, Jews and Israelis. Uh, those are some things that help bring about peace. And I would hope that uh, we would see that. We all long for peace. Nobody wants there to be conflict. Nobody wants there to be war. Nobody wants there to be uh, unnecessary, brutal, savage deaths. But there has to be understanding and a clear recognition that Israel has a right to exist and has a right to defend itself. Uh, I've never supported, ever, the notion that a two-state solution would mean that Israelis would be uh, disrupted from their homeland. Uh, a Palestinian peace is something to me separate, but I think the notion of two governments operating on the same piece of real estate is unrealistic and unworkable. I've never endorsed or supported that notion. Sorry, to follow up on that. Okay. So you said clearly that you think the West Bank is Israel, it's part of Israel. Judea and Samaria, yeah. Sure. Uh -huh. <laughs> I don't know that Israel has ever suggested that they uh, be deported out of uh, out of the country. What, if you do not support a Palestinian state mm -hmm. on any of that territory because you see it as part of Israel, what then shall they do? I think that's a question for the Israelis and the Palestinians to sit down and negotiate. But the one thing I have noticed, because I've, I've been to places, for example, in Judea with a soda stream factory where I visited last summer, 1,100 people were working at that factory, even though it was under intense pressure and targeting from the irrational BDS movement, which is insane. 1,100 people working, there's 600 of them were Palestinian. 500 of them were Israeli Jews. They worked side by side. They got along. The Palestinians working in that facility were making four times the average paycheck for any job they would get in the PA. They were able to take much better care of their families. They had full health care, all kinds of benefits. And to me, if you want to talk about a solution, it's the solution of people working together, living together, and, and understanding, building a strong economy where people can take care of their families better than they've ever been able to do. And that's what I saw. I saw it at Ariel, too, when I've been there. And, I'm sorry, I, just, I don't, yeah. I don't Well, no one has asked me to come and negotiate that what would be process. Your, what is your solution if not to have a Palestinian state on at least some of this territory? I just said I think my solution is to uh, have great respect for the Israeli government and the Palestinians if they wish to negotiate how they work this out. But I think for Americans to come in and say, yeah, give up land for peace, how well has that worked out for Israel? They did that in Gaza. I saw the video at Gush Katif when people were, uh, what, 10,000 Israelis were taken from their homes and their synagogues and their shops. Did that cause Gaza to become a wonderful partner of peaceful coexistence? 
I was here last August when the rockets were coming out of Gaza. Uh, I heard the sirens. I, I'm telling you, if, if that's land for peace, both the land and the peace were miserably failed. And so there's got to be a better understanding of, of how that can be achieved. So far, it has not worked out. Yes. One more question. Can we just follow? If the West Bank is part of Israel and you identify with Israel having the same values as Americans, how do you feel about the fact that the Palestinian population of the West Bank does not have the right to vote? Or do you think it's okay for part of the population of a country not to have the right to vote? Well, they certainly have the right to vote in municipal elections, and about 90% so of them choose not to vote. Okay. Well, let me finish. You, do you want to ask a question, or you want to answer my question? I want you to respond to the I'm trying to. voting in the national elections of the country that you say they are uh -huh. part of. Uh, again, that's a, that's a decision for the Israeli government. I'm just mentioning to you that though they have the right to vote in municipal elections, 90% of them choose not to. Uh, maybe if they were uh, feeling that sense of civic obligation at the local level, uh, there would be a greater sense of opening it up to the national level. I, I can't speak to that. Okay. All right. Hi. Hi. Um, question regarding American policy, not Israeli. Um, do you at all agree with Mr. Donald Trump's uh, uh, policy uh, suggestion regarding the immigration? And do you think that the U.S. should go away from the uh, birthright? Uh, yeah, as I said, I, I'm, I'm not going to get into an evaluation of Donald Trump. He's got his own platform. I have mine. I'll speak to mine, but not to his. So what do you think of the... Of the of, That's his that platform. I'll let him answer it. Hi, yes. I always learn something new. I, I, I can't recall anyone who uh, took me to task for the things that I said. There may be some people who disagree with me. Uh, one individual, I, I will tell you about one conversation I thought was interesting. Um, one individual challenged me uh, to defend the Israeli ambassador, Ron Dermer, who has gone to the U.S. and talked to members of Congress and trying to alarm them about the Iranian deal and asked did I think it was appropriate. And I pointed out that the whole purpose of an ambassador is to represent his or her country's interest to the country where they've been assigned. And if an ambassador goes and does nothing but goes to cocktail parties and chomps down on hors d'oeuvres, the people of that nation should recall that ambassador and save the money. The whole point of having an ambassador is to make sure that that ambassador represents the views of that country. And so I thought it was absolutely appropriate. Uh, I think it's commendable that the Israelis are officially making their position known uh, to the leaders in the American government. And I hope they would continue to. That's a very important part of this process. Thank you very much. Thank you.